Good afternoon, everybody. There are lots of friends in the rooms. I'm sorry to interrupt your conversations, but it's in a good cause for a much wider conversation. Uh, my name is Tom Banshoff. I'm Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown and Director of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. I'm also a professor in the School of Foreign Service, which is relevant in today's context. It's great to see so many friends and colleagues, uh, faculty, students, staff, senior administrators, members of our wider Georgetown and DC communities. Here this afternoon to celebrate our dear colleague, friend, and companion of so many years, Carol Lancaster. And Kurt and Doug, it's particularly wonderful to have you with us this afternoon. We'll have some time together to talk about Carol, to share reminiscences, but we'll really be focusing on some of her passions. And I think she would like that. Uh, we'll be focusing on her intellectual passions, on her policy passions, about what mattered to her and about what continues to matter to us. Our topic, as you know, is development, diplomacy, and gender. Three areas, intersecting areas of Carol's interest and passion, areas where she made tremendous contributions here at Georgetown, to the foreign policy of the United States, and to the wider world. Now, I think the arc of Carol's impressive career is familiar to most of you here. She graduated from the School of Foreign Service in 1964, went on to a PhD at the London School of Economics in 1972, and then served with distinction in the State Department, rejoining our community as a faculty member in 1981. She was then pulled away to government service again and worked as deputy administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development from 1993 to 1996. And then we got her back. We got her back as a scholar, as a colleague, and when she took over in 2010 as dean of SFS, as a hard-driving and passionate leader here on campus. That is very much just a shell, just a framework, and it's very exciting. We're really going to have an opportunity this afternoon to fill it up with life through recollections and reflections, uh, the sharing of four of Carol's friends here at Georgetown who can speak to her wonderful legacy firsthand. We have a great group who can address issues of diplomacy, development, and gender from different perspectives, linking Carol's academic and policy contributions to the challenges we face today as a national and international community. To introduce our panel and to moderate our conversation, I'm delighted to introduce Milan Verveer, founding executive director of our Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, a close friend and collaborator to Carol of many years. Milan is known to most everyone here for her many accomplishments. I'll just list two. She was our first US ambassador at large for global women's issues and co-chair and CEO of Vital Voices Global Partnerships, which she founded, co-founded with Hillary Rodham Clinton. So thank you again for being here, and please join me in welcoming our panel and Milan Verveer. Thank you, Tom, and a special welcome to everybody. You know, to say that Carol was passionate, anybody here who knew her, it's probably an understatement. Uh, but hopefully we can touch on some of those uh, passions today. As Tom said, uh, I like the way you phrased it, that she was pulled away to government uh, from time to time. I first met her when she was the deputy administrator at USAID, and we've got a contingent of folks who worked with her there, and hopefully they will uh, add to the reflections that we make up here, uh, as well as others who cross paths with her in very significant ways. And, in these areas, but our panel today uh, also represents uh, three very distinguished careers uh, in government service, either at the State Department, as in the case of Ambassador McHenry, or at USAID, as in the case of Steve Radelet, as well as other assignments, and the World Bank, as in the case of Catherine Marshall. Uh, so before we engage in uh, the conversation or the personal reflections, uh, let me introduce each of them to you, uh, just in case uh, you may not know them. And I think your conclusion at the end of these introductions will be how fortunate that we have them all here at Georgetown. Uh, at least we continue to have you, right, Ambassador McHenry? Uh, 
So Ambassador McHenry has had a very distinguished uh, diplomatic career. He served as the uh, US ambassador, or the permanent rep, as we say, uh, to the United Nations. And he was a member of President Carter's cabinet in that capacity. And at the time he was first named uh, to the UN in that very significant role, he had already been serving as the deputy uh, representative to the UN Security Council uh, for the United States. And upon leaving the State Department, he continued to be called up for special government assignments, which is no surprise to any of us who know uh, what an extraordinary diplomat he's been. He was the special envoy of President Clinton's for Nigeria. Uh, he was engaged with the Congressional Task Force on the UN. He was a member of the UN panel of eminent persons on Algeria, and one could go on and on. He has also served in a number of positions in some of the most prominent think tanks and been uh, a trustee for NGOs, for foundations, and for corporations. But perhaps most importantly, given where we are, he was the distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy at the School of Foreign Service from 81 up until last year when he decided to retire. Uh, but upon his retirement, Georgetown established the Donald F. McHenry Chair in Global Human Development, which is now held by our next panelist. So if you think this is incestuous, uh, it probably is in some respects. Steve Radlett, in addition to being the McHenry Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Development, is also the director of the School of Foreign Services Global Human Development Program, which is an extraordinary initiative uh, here at Georgetown that we finally have in the SFS curriculum, if I can make that personal editorial. Uh, his research and teaching focus has been on economic growth, poverty reduction, foreign aid, debt, primarily in Africa and Asia, very easy topics to uh, grapple with in these times. He previously served as the chief economist for USAID and as a senior advisor for development uh, for Secretary Clinton positions during which time I came to know S Stephen really respect and admire uh, his work. He was also deputy assistant secretary of the treasury for Africa, the Middle East and Asia. He has served as an advisor to ministries of finance in several countries, and perhaps most importantly, he's a key, key advisor to uh, President Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, whom I saw fairly recently, and the first thing she said is, give my best to Steve. Uh, so he does great work for her, um, and he was a volunteer in Western Samoa with his wife for the Peace Corps, and she today is the head of the Peace Corps. So we're happy about that. And our third panelist is Catherine Marshall, who is a professor in the School of Foreign Service and a senior fellow at Georgetown's Berkeley Center. She too has had a very distinguished career uh, in international development, focusing on issues confronting the world's poorest nations. For more than three decades, she was involved in a range of leadership positions at the World Bank, mostly focused on Africa, uh, with key assignments as country director in the Africa region, uh, working on the banks and social policy issue, governance issues during the uh, East Asia financial crisis. Uh, she also engaged extensively on Latin America. I first came to know Catherine uh, during her work at the bank uh, on her role of women and issues of values and ethics, which were fairly new issues at the time that the bank was undertaking. Uh, and then at the World Economic Forum, where she is a pillar uh, in the work she is doing on the Council of 100, an initiative of the World Economic Forums to advance understanding uh, between the Islamic world and the West. Again, a very big challenge for these times. And she has also been involved in the creation of the World Faiths Development Dialogue, issues that have only grown in importance uh, over the years. So with that, let me just note that Georgetown is extraordinarily fortunate to be able to claim all of you. And uh, with that, also let me say, Ambassador McHenry, let me call you Dan, Don. Um, 
let's begin with your perspective on Carol's work, um, her impact on development, and particularly diplomacy, uh, and here at Georgetown. Well, Carol, uh, Carol had one of those remarkable careers for Washington. Uh, she had been in the private sector in terms of uh, NGOs. She was on the Hill. She was in the State Department. She was in the think tanks. Uh, she knew uh, this city extremely well. And she used that experience, uh, particularly her scholarship, in terms of, of her own analysis of not only what needed to be done in terms of development, but she had a very good sense of how to do it. Uh, you saw that here at Georgetown. Uh, Carol uh, moved from spot to spot. She was, uh, when I called her in a note to you, she was our utility infielder. But she never uh, acted like a caretaker. Uh, in each of those positions, she called upon uh, that experience, which she had attained over the years, <coughs> uh, to move her ideas, her vision, in terms of development further, whether it was education or global human development or trying to get more minority students in the MSFS program. Uh, she was a, a tighter at it. And once she decided it was going to be done, it was going to be done. We're familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on at least one occasion, I, I, I'm on record as saying that I expressed some doubt to her <laughs> about something she wanted to get You're done. You're a brave man. <laughs> but in the at least end. one occasion or only one occasion? <laughs> well, <laughs> one stands out. Uh, and it was, uh, in the final analysis, done in terms of the Global Human Development Program. Uh, I think one of the reasons that she was uh, so successful in all of these things is that, uh, A, she wasn't sold on herself. And B, she came to be very pragmatic in terms of aid, for example. Uh, she, if you read her writings, she traces all of the rationalizations given for aid over the years, whether it was security or, uh, or, uh, or, or women or whatever, and she, or, or helping American agriculture. Uh, and she got to the point, I think, where she concluded, I don't care what the rationalization is. These are the programs that I think we need to do in order to get something done. Call it what you want. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that was, uh, an, was a key con contributor to uh, her success. Her success, uh, whether in government, uh, as an educator, uh, or as an administrator. And uh, it, it was the approach that she had, which, as I say, she wasn't sold upon herself. I, I, I can continue here. I, I, there were two more points that I wanted to make about Carol. Uh, and, or one more point. And it's one which uh, may come or did come to me as something of a surprise. As most of you know, Carol had already uh, indicated that she was going to give up the deanship in the School of Foreign Service. And she had done that before she became ill. Uh, she looked forward to returning to writing and, and more time for <coughs> teaching. Uh, I had a chance to speak with her and at that point, at a point when she was clearly terminally ill. But Carol still had a spark. Carol still was talking about uh, the research that she wanted to do. And I thought that research was going to be um, something more in the, in the aid uh, theory and development, and, and surely it would have included that. But I was surprised. 
because I came to know still another element of Carol, uh, which I think contributed to her success and her philosophical outlook. The research she wanted to do was about Washington, D.C. And her own life here, growing up in this city. Uh, and it would have been, I think, and I hope it will be interesting, to see how much her experiences in this city uh, contributed to this uh, outlook, which was at once provincial, but also very, very worldly, mm -hmm. uh, and reflected, uh, I think, in her, in her scholarship, certainly in her approach to uh, her colleagues and her uh, constant searching for ways to improve uh, the cadre of young people who would go out and engage in development. I think that point on um, Washington is so true because any of us who talked to her in those last months, she was determined she was still going to finish her book on Washington. And um, she had a love for this city and the fact that she grew up here uh, as something that was a, made a big imprint on her uh, and perhaps in the ways that it manifested itself that you just said. Steve. Um, you, you, in many ways, in your current position, fulfill one of Carol's dreams, which is to have um, a global development program here at Georgetown. And I remember in the years when I was working in the White House, I had a, uh, an assistant who was a graduate of the School of Foreign Service. Uh, I had a tendency to hire Georgetown grads whenever I had a chance. <laughs> And she used to bemoan to me constantly that here she was now working on development issues with the then First Lady, and she'd never taken a development course at, at the School of Foreign Service. And we have come a long way. This seems like it wasn't that long ago. So talk to us a little bit about both her imprint on development and policy, and then the huge difference she made here at Georgetown in this respect. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, and thrilled to be on this panel talking about uh, Carol and and wonderful to see Kurt and Doug and and so many people that that uh, that love Carol. Uh, I first met Carol in 1991, actually before she joined USAID. I had just finished my uh, my uh, doctoral dissertation work up at Harvard, and I had been doing a lot of writing. I'd lived in Sub-Saharan Africa for a couple of years, and my work was at the intersection of economics and politics in Sub-Saharan Africa around stabilization structural adjustment programs. And I wrote a paper that she seemed to like. We were at a conference up at Harvard. I was speaking. Afterwards, we were at a crowded reception around the bar, not surprisingly. Very crowded people pushing around, very little space. And, and I'm standing there, and I, and I get this. It's very crowded. I get this poke. I turn around. <laughs> I'm Carol Lancaster. I really like your work. I want you to write a chapter for a book I'm editing. She's pointing right up at me, and I'm just, OK, OK. <laughs> so I learned immediately that that was the right response with Carol. So we started to work on that. Uh, the book actually was never uh, written or edited because th she then went off to USAID uh, in, in part of her many uh, iterations back and forth in the policy world and academia. But that was my introduction to Carol, and I will never forget it. Um, she had a huge impact um, intellectually and scholarly on how we think about foreign aid because she went right after an area which is so critical and that people don't think about it very much, which is the intersection of politics, institutions, and economics. And scholars tend to do economics or politics or institutions. And Carol's great contribution was to look at the intersection of, of all of those. Uh, she wrote or edited, I think, at least 10 books. I came in this morning and looked up on my shelf. And within about two minutes, I pulled four of them off my own shelf, which have been uh, very influential to me uh, uh, that she wrote over the years, uh, Aid to Africa, So Much to Do, So Little Done, which I think was about 1999, uh, Transforming Foreign Aid, 
uh, U.S. Assistance in the 21st Century, which is a, a short book and one that I have read and I underline and, and I use passages of this actually in my textbook because it is such a good overview of U.S. foreign assistance. Uh, George Bush's foreign aid transformation or chaos, um, <laughs> and I think the answer is both actually, <laughs> generously. Um, she had fun, maybe fun isn't, she, 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 she had fun writing this book. Um, and then her really classic scholarly book, Foreign Aid, Diplomacy, Development, and uh, Domestic Politics. This is a terrific uh, book, University of Chicago Press, 2007, I think. Uh, and what she does in here is systematically go through uh, various donor agencies, the United States, uh, Germany, France, Japan, Denmark, and there's one more. Um, that she looked through systematically in terms of what drives foreign aid in these countries. What are the domestic political constituencies? What are their motivations? How are they organized? How are they structured? And to my knowledge, it's the only uh, comparative analytic book uh, on foreign aid structures, on the institutions and the politics. And it's really a, a masterful work and really makes you recognize the multiple um, motivations for aid. We tend to think it's all about economic development or it's all about f helping our farmers here at home uh, or, or it's all about uh, the moral uh, imperative to help those are, that are poor. Uh, it turns out it's all of those things and you need a framework to begin to untangle that and think through that and that's what she does in this book better than, than anyone that I've ever seen. So I use that book uh, uh, all the time uh, in my own writing and thinking and also in, in the classroom. Uh, so she had a huge intellectual contribution. She had a terrific ability to integrate the real world, uh, the policy world, and the practical world. Of course, her work at State and USAID. But I saw this uh, more recently. Doug was, was, was with me. Um, we were in Ethiopia with Carol, uh, with the Aspen Institute in August of 2013. And we had 23 or 24 members of Congress, 23 members of Congress, uh, with us uh, for a week in Ethiopia, in Addis. And with Doug's help, we managed to pile them all on two big air-conditioned buses and with these members of Congress in their shorts and socks and looking like tourists, which was quite a sight, and, and trundled out to this, to this little town to visit Peace Corps volunteers working in a school and in a clinic. And Carol was absolutely delighted to see this because this was the intersection of her academic work and her thinking of how the world worked in an Ethiopian village with schools and clinics. On, you can't get more on the ground. And 24, 23 members of Congress, the, the political and policy side. And the intersection was right there. And she was giddy as a schoolgirl, running around. She was just really, this is so cool. This is, look what they're doing over here. They're in this classroom. Uh, and she was absolutely delighted to kind of see these different pieces come together uh, and understood how important it was and how rare it was actually to get policymakers right down to the to literally the village level. So uh, that was what her work was all about. But the GHD program uh, is a big uh, a big part of it, um, uh, and and I'm delighted to to run the the program and 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 be part of that uh, that legacy uh, with Don's <coughs> help. We've got great support from uh, the Coca-Cola company, and I have these. Coca-Cola cans here with Carol's name. I actually, thanks to our friend Mr. Cashin, have 50 of these Carol Coke cans <laughs> in my office <laughs> as part of her legacy. But the GHD program, the Global Human Development Program, really does embody this idea of the scholarly work, the practical tools, and the practitioner's focus on getting things done. And in many ways, I see as one of her many legacies, uh, not just the GHD program, but the GHD students, and a bunch of them are here. Can you guys, can you stand up? I'm going to pick on, and sorry to, but um, this, <coughs> so the, the program is not really her legacy. These students are her legacy. I mm -hmm. think of myself partly as her legacy because I learned so much. But everything that these people do in their career will be traced back to Carol and, uh, and what she did here and the programs she set up here and the tools and the resources that are available to them as they go out and do the great things that they will do in their career. And, and that is really her, her, her living legacy, which is what the GHD program um, is all about. Um, 
at a at a personal level, um, uh, you know, Carol uh, meant a lot to me from way back uh, those many many years ago. But few people that I uh, have come across embodied the the courage, the tenacity, the scholarly curiosity, and the ability to just welcome everyone and treat everyone with incredible respect uh, that I saw with, with Carol. Uh, and, and some people have one of those attributes or the other. She had them all and was able to have scholarly impatience but also great caring at the same time and bring those together. And, and, and that, for me, is a, is a great uh, legacy. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I don't want us to just, you know, to, to kind of think just about the past, of much of the work that she has started. There's a huge amount of work to be done on development. There's still a billion people in the world that live under a dollar a day, and there's still six million children that die every year from preventable diseases and, and many other things. It's a lot better than it used to be, um, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, Carol's passion on working on foreign aid. Aid agencies are better today because of the work she's done. When I was at USAID, her thinking uh, was clearly uh, making the, the organization evolve in good ways. But there's still a long way to go. Her vision of, of making aid programs more effective in, in fighting poverty and fighting hunger uh, has come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, and Carol broke a lot of glass ceilings over time in many, many ways. She was a pioneer. Actually, she broke a lot of cement ceilings, I think, too, uh, <laughs> along the way. But a lot of those ceilings are still there. And uh, uh, the issues of, of, of women and girls uh, having uh, the opportunities to go to school, to have health care, to be uh, fully incorporated into political systems, to have the basic opportunities that they deserve for themselves, but also to better society have not yet been realized. And, and for uh, so much of her work remains to be done, and, and I think it's up to all of us to find ways to, to continue to carry that work forward. Thanks. That's great. So, um, Catherine, um, Carol always used to speak so fondly of you and the fact that you were at Georgetown. And you talked and worked with her on a range of issues. I mean, the most eclectic portfolios, I think, from Latin America to religion to so much in between. Give us some sense of um, how you and she related to each other and what you were trying to do here and what her interests were. Oh, I have the sense that Carol is very much here uh, and wanted to to speak first a little bit about, about the issue of friendship and the personal side. I remember actually the glee in her eyes when she said that Milan, and then at another point, Steve had been somehow captured. Because they were, and were, and were captured coming. is a good word, because in her mind, said. they were victories and that were she coming, had made happen. Coming to Georgetown. But one thing that we, we had not mentioned, but which I think is, is implicit in everything that's been said is, her deep commitment to students and her love of teaching. And that was my most active engagement over the last couple of years was teaching uh, in the uh, Global Human Development Program. And there you saw Carol in full color, uh, where she was pushing the students, as I'm sure all of you will attest. Uh, we had fishbowl uh, sessions where everyone critiqued everyone else and where we were working on presentations. And she, as she kept saying, I want to push you further, push you, push you, uh, so that you do what you don't even know that you can do. But this, I think this love of students and commitment to teaching is one of the important things. But we also saw through Carol's illness something that I hope none of us ever have to experience, but the extraordinary loyalty of her remarkable circle of friends was really, was really a stunning tribute to the person. And it lasted. It wasn't a flash in the pan. People were deeply committed, all of us, uh, to doing everything that we could. And it, it was a testimony to the diversity of her friends. They came from all over. Uh, we had messages from people that you would never have expected. And I think we all still celebrate and, and live with her quirky sense of humor, <laughs> her funky necklaces, uh, all of her, um, her many different uh, elements of curiosity and, 
uh, hunger and energy and, as you said, Steve, her courage and her intense commitment to, to doing things. I think she was really um, an example of, that women can do almost everything. And she would never have accepted that something could not could not be done. And I think that's a characteristic. She would have been, I think, thrilled that we're having this event today, right after Hillary Clinton has announced her <laughs> candidacy. And I can just imagine the uh, wheels spinning uh, on, what, uh, on what lies ahead. I think we can celebrate so many of the things that she has left behind. And you've, uh, Don and Steve and, and Milan, you've spoken about so many of them. Uh, the impact on development thinking and action, the impact on Georgetown, which she loved. I suspect she even had an impact on the basketball team, though I'm not quite <laughs> sure how. Um, but she really, she really was a part of the generation of women who led the revolution in thinking about gender issues. And her books came one after another. She really was deeply committed to understanding the role that politics played. Um, I was trying to find out where one of the unfinished books was. Uh, and Nick uh, Van de Valle said, yes, we can say it's a 2015 book, the one on politics uh, and, um, and development. But he had a wonderful comment, I think, that Carol had a combination of analytic skills and insider political savvy. She could take down various academic nostrums with great acuity, particularly when it was obvious that they had little relevance to the policy world she knew so well. At the same time, she was one of the few policy people I ever met who always saw the whole forest and was not mostly lost in that forest. So I think at Georgetown, she set a tone for the School of Foreign Service that had this commitment to looking at new ideas, caring about students. And she has all of the organizations and institutions that she left behind the GHD, the Center for Peace and Secure, Women, Peace, and Security. She was also involved in the creation of the Berkeley Center. In fact, that's how I got to know her particularly well as she tried to entice me to come from the World Bank. Um, that said, there, there is unfinished business. She had bees in her bonnet. I think Steve mentioned some of them, and I certainly heard about them, and I even wake up in the middle of the night sometimes thinking about the business that we have still to do uh, that I think was very much on her agenda. Uh, I wanted to pick out just four. The first one is I think that gender issues as a contemporary continuing challenge is something that she was acutely aware of. Uh, for a long time, I think people thought the gender battles were over. Uh, the, but there's clearly not. First of all, worldwide, they're not but even in this country. And they're at the very personal level in the way people live their lives and relationships, but they're also in the political sphere, uh, in the economic sphere, in the ethical sphere, in all of those. So I think there's a gender agenda, which is an important one. Uh, she was very interested in the religion and the, and the politics of development. And one of her unfinished books was about the evangelical movement and it's, impact in the United States. That book may not be written. Uh, Doug was saying that the house is full of <laughs> books on the topic. Uh, but it's an interesting comment that, uh, I think it's a very astute comment, that uh, her understanding of, of the way in which religion influences politics, not only in the areas that we see so visibly today in the Muslim world, but also in the United States, and the difficulty in having a sober and insightful discussion about what those roles of religion are. So I think Carol was very much thinking about those. She was very preoccupied with the problem of failing and weak states uh, and of what, that, what difference that makes in development thinking. What are the causes? Why are countries like Cote d'Ivoire that seemed solid falling apart, um, countries in Latin America, uh, countries in other parts of the world? What, what is it that really can be done more effectively, not for the countries that are on track, the ones that are doing well, but the ones that are not doing well? And the final point is that she was very concerned about defining and thinking about and finding ways to approach 
the issues of ethics in development and diplomacy. And she thought that Georgetown should be known as the place where the most cutting edge thinking, the most courageous thinking, uh, the most out of the box thinking about these ethical questions is, uh, is at the fore. And that was something that she had various discussions with a number of us. And it is, I think, one of the areas of unfinished business. She certainly didn't see a divorce between the campus and the outside world. In fact, she saw it as a very close nexus that had to feed uh, off of both, both components. You know, this whole issue of the evangelicals is so interesting because I remember having many discussions with Carol about what the evangelical community in the United States represented during George W. Bush's administration and that enormous investment in PEPFAR for HIV AIDS, which probably two things astounded her. One, this massive amount of money for a development program dealing with HIV AIDS, uh, which, and I'll talk a little bit about the struggle that she first found herself in when she went into uh, the number two position at AID. So that, plus the fact that it was largely uh, contributed to by a community that was, at least in policy circles, not viewed as uh, central to development and yet had this enormous political influence that unleashed a tremendous impact on development. And that, to her, I think, was something worth teasing out and figuring out what more is there here uh, that we could work together on. Because she was, to a great extent, as you've heard, somebody who brought people together. Uh, I just want to add a, a few points from my own experience to what our colleagues have said. Uh, one is I'm not sure many people know um, what a pivotal role Carol played uh, in the early part of the Clinton administration. She had been appointed in 93, uh, and it was at the same time uh, that USAID was tremendously under the gun. And in many ways, she was instrumental in an inside way uh, in saving USAID because uh, there was a great desire for the peace dividend. Why do we need to be spending the kind of money we've been spending as though we were spending a huge amount of the federal budget on development, which we know has never been um, much more than 1%, if that. And at the same time, there was this tremendous political pushback from Capitol Hill led by uh, Senator Helms at the time to really um, move AID to the to the point where it would uh, literally not exist as it as it had, and Carol, being Carol, knew she had to do something about this. She was not exactly satisfied with the way the leadership uh, of AID was able to get in there to make those fine political arguments uh, to get the president to do the right thing in the end, and so. She decided she would take the cause on, uh, and she would call me. I was working for the First Lady at the time, and she would say, I have a very important memo. Uh, we've worked hard on this memo. It lays the case out, but none of us is sure anybody in the White House has seen it. So I'm going to get it to you, and the implicit message was, and you're going to give it to the First Lady, and she's going to give it to the President, and we're all going to save USAID. And pretty much that's how a lot of the key arguments uh, for saving AID at the time, you know, um, were, were made. Uh, USIA went out of business as we knew it and became part of the State Department, but not AID. And AID was the first candidate for that kind of merger. So Carol, again, you know, nobody put this in her agenda. That's not how she was. She really believed in this institution that she now was playing a pivotal leadership role in, and by God, she was going to figure out who her intermediaries were uh, in what she could do. The second point um, I want to make about her is one that Catherine especially made, and Steve made it in a way as well, and that is her understanding of the pivotal role that women play in development. Uh, not just as b beneficiaries, uh, but also as agents of change. Uh, and she made a very early trip. It was the, really the first solo trip um, that the First Lady had made on, on her own 
uh, to South Asia. Carol was part of a very small delegation. She was the representative of AID. And a lot of what we were doing was looking at what was working because the goal of the trip was let's look at what's working and then hopefully the message is get political leaders to understand why this matters and ultimately get a lot of these smaller projects to be taken to scale. And they were, many of them were nascent uh, in terms of investments uh, during those days. Girls' education, a number of health programs, microcredit and economic development. These were still at a, at a very embryonic stage uh, in terms of investing in women uh, in this kind of work. Uh, and Carol did exactly what Steve said. She got so enthusiastic going to the projects themselves. The whole time you knew her brain was turning about how she was gonna translate this into uh, policy and advocacy pieces and melding her experiences together, but she more than anything loved being on the ground and seeing how these programs actually work because that's what they were meant to do. They weren't to be hatched in the ivory tower and executed somewhere up there, but they were to be uh, really worked through on the ground. And when uh, the Clinton administration came to a close, there had been a program uh, that was run out of the State Department called the Vital Voices Democracy Initiative. And it was a program to really invest in um, particularly with the collapse of the former Soviet Union to invest in women's uh, leadership that would be needed to move from command economies to market economies, to move from, uh, from uh, the kind of system of government that that represented to nascent democracies. Uh, and Carol watched the evolution of all of this and she cheered from the sidelines. And then we were at a point of what, how would we continue? After all, there were these women all over the world now who were uh, committed to coming together and being able to learn the skills that they needed to, to carry on and to exchange those kinds of um, relationships and, and best practices that worked for them with others. And so I came to Carol. We had set up an NGO to continue this work. Carol was here on campus. And I said, Carol, we really uh, need help now. Do you think Georgetown can be involved in some way? Well, give her an idea, and all of the bells and whistles go off immediately. Uh, before I knew it, she had set up an advisory group of some of the women professors on campus. Uh, yes, she wanted to have some of the training for the people the State Department was still paying to come in. She, yes, let's do that on campus. Magically, classroom space was procured. Uh, and it was a very robust relationship that Carol herself made happen by virtue of her relationships, uh, which you never play down. And I remember uh, one day being in South Africa and uh, a woman came up to me and she said, oh, you saved my life. And I didn't know what she was talking about. And as I began to peel this comment apart, she said, don't you remember and the Georgetown campus? Um, I learned all these business tactics and uh, leadership and communication skills. And I still have my Georgetown Vital Voices certificate. Well, nobody knew those were being produced, but I still, <laughs> I still have it on my wall. She was from Rwanda. This was in Kigali. And she today heads up the Gahaya um, big co-op and there are a thousand women working on making baskets, uh, exporting to Macy's and West Elm and other stores because of the energy that one woman, later supported by AID, was able to unleash to create sustainable, uh, a sustainable income for large numbers of people. This is what Carol relished more than anything. She loved these kinds of uh, coming together of ideas that she had completely committed herself to, in this case, development and investing in women, uh, and then seeing the, the product of that. Uh, and that manifested itself in so many ways. She personally became engaged. At one point, uh, we were doing a, a capacity building training for women from Iran, which was a very dangerous thing to do in some ways. 
And um, this was a, a, a local NGO leader asked us to please help with these women. And the more I talked to the experts, the more they said, be careful because you don't know what will happen to the women uh, if they come out to participate in something like this. You need academic cover. Well, who did I call? I called Carol. I said, Carol, will you be the academic cover for this program? She flew to Istanbul. She opened the program. She spent time with these women from Iran. They got so much out of it. I, I prayed uh, from the moment they left Istanbul till they got back to Iran in hopes that nothing would happen to them. Nothing ever did because Carol was their angel, their protectress. Uh, and someone who saw the value of this. Uh, so this was a lot of, of uh, the extension of what, you, what you've been hearing uh, over the last uh, uh, several minutes. And then finally, uh, let me just say that the institute that we have today at Georgetown on Women, Peace, and Security was another Carol understanding. This was a moment for this university, if we would seize it, uh, that just as there is a recognition of and the data buttressing this recognition that women are critical to development, high yield investments in development, certainly they were critical to the area of peace and security. And couldn't this university bring added value uh, to what had then become uh, a growing recognition among many governments and certainly our own, uh, that we, we needed to marry academic thinking and research and scholarship with the practitioners. Uh, what could we learn from what was happening on the ground? What could we do to really begin to make the case in terms of enhancing our diplomacy, uh, enhancing our development work, and our military operations as well? Carol got that from the moment that this work began to uh, magnify uh, in terms of our own government's investment. And it was she who kept thinking, this needs to happen at Georgetown because we need to continue this. To me, that is the stuff of this woman. Uh, she took her great brilliance and was never satisfied with letting that be the end all and be all of who she was. Because more than anything, she wanted to impact the lives of so many. Uh, and as Catherine said, the whole role of um, women's place in our world today was one that she saw as a cutting edge issue that really needed to be seriously addressed. So those are our reflections, but it's just the beginning of our conversation. Um, so we will have a little exchange up here, but I see so many people in this room uh, who knew Carol very well. Uh, you must have your own um, remembrances that are worth sharing, but particularly what it had to do with the bigger issues, what it had to do with the university, what it had to do with policy, uh, what it had to do with opening new ways of, of growing uh, solutions. I know some people have flown in from, from France who worked with Carol on culture, and there's so many others here. Uh, but let us um, talk a little bit among ourselves for starters. Uh, about some of the things that were raised here. Uh, one of the issues, Steve, you made the point uh, in several different ways about Carol's writings. And mm -hmm. uh, you made a comment about how much fun she had working on one of those books, <laughs> which is about critiquing what was happening to development during the Bush administration. At the same time, she, she later grew to understand what PEPFAR actually was able to achieve, as yep. well as MCC. Right. She wasn't there in the beginning, the Millennium uh, Challenge Corporation. But this whole issue that we used to fight with her on over the long-term nation of long-term understanding of development, that this is something you go at, it doesn't begin to demonstrate results, perhaps for years, mm -hmm. but you make these investments mm -hmm as opposed to the short-term interest of the State Department and crises and we need AID to get in there and this is what we need to be the solution. So where did Carol fit into this? And all of you can jump into this because mm -hmm. she had some very strong views and those views began to evolve some as well. Yep, she did. Uh, she did have strong views on it and her um, 
concerns that were articulated to me at the time were around the institutional impact that those programs had on our other aid agencies, particularly USAID. So, and, and it's a distinction that a lot of people missed who were not directly inside and involved. That PEPFAR, as, as uh, helpful as it has been, as great as it's been, as it saved millions and millions of lives, she could see that, but that it was established uh, outside of USAID with an office in the State Department uh, and drew resources and people away from USAID and set up, uh, frankly, some competition within different agencies, the CDC, HHS, State, USAID, which have far from been resolved in some ways they've been mm -hmm. accentuated. So she saw the, the institutional side, the, the negative institutional side of that. And the same thing with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, as much good as it has done, it further kind of splintered uh, foreign assistance. And so she was concerned not only about the short-term obvious, look, this can save lives, which is great, but what impact does this have on the broader set of institutions? And, and one of the main lessons of this book is that a lot of the attention is on the positive side and well-deserved, but that there was a negative institutional side um, that then had to be fixed uh, later, and it became uh, at the time, uh, I was uh, starting to co-chair a group called the Moderniz Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network, and that set as part of it the agenda, very much inspired by Carol, that uh, with the new administration was to try to begin to rectify and rebuild USAID as an institution. And that has been partially accomplished. There's a, a policy office has been reestablished, a budget office has been reestablished. They've hired uh, close to a thousand new foreign service officers, and and that. It was the beginning of a resolution of an issue that she articulated. So the point is that she was very good at, at going beyond, look, this is saving lives to, yes, but is there a better way that we can do this that will actually strengthen our aid institutions rather than undermining them while achieving the same ends? What about Africa? She obviously had a passion for the continent, for the people, uh, as was alluded. Uh, one of the last trips, it was maybe the last foreign trip she made, uh, was to uh, Ethiopia with that Aspen group. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on failed states. Uh, she was tortured over what was happening. And all of you in some way, uh, there's a strain of Africa that goes through all of your experiences and certainly your interactions with her. Can we tease that out a little bit more in terms of... Um, her interest in Africa and what she was thinking about uh, in terms of trying to remedy the situation? Well, following from what Steve was saying, I always saw in Carol the tension between politics as people, as personalities, and politics as forces at work. Uh, and I think that in looking at Africa, she, she was schizophrenic, uh, as I think many of us have been, particularly during the sort of tragic years of the 70s and 80s, uh, when things were falling apart. Uh, and she was fascinated by what she, was, she called and what she heard as, as political settlements. Uh, and this sense that in order to get to move forward uh, in a situation of governance challenges, social challenges, uh, et cetera, you really had to have the core um, political uh, compromises and agreements that would allow you to be both practical and visionary. And I think that we saw that in, in her teaching in the last years, that that was one of her central themes, was uh, this combination of the ideal uh, and idealism and, and the pragmatism. So I, I think she was, as, as many of us were, in love with Africa. Um, and I think she saw, as many people fail to do, the extraordinary diversity of situations in the continent. I don't think she would ever have fallen in the trap of coming up with a single single recipe or a single solution uh, for a diverse continent. But it was, I think, what she was really 
gro groping towards or grasping for was this sense of how do you make the politics uh, work in ways that are consistent with the, the better angels, the, the instincts, and the directions that we want to move in. I, I, I always had the feeling that, that uh, Carol didn't spend that much time on the, uh, the politics of Africa in, in terms of her own view of development. Uh, it was uh, that in the long term, you can't really build unless you do something with these fundamental problems, the role of women and disease, um, the impact of the environment. And uh, it seems to me that, uh, that to the extent that I m remember her uh, talking about uh, uh, these areas, uh, she could be remarkably uh, uh, critical of institutions and she could also be, at the same time, she could attack some sacred cows. For example, uh, Carol could be scathing in some of her criticisms of, the, of those organizations which delivered aid, uh, the NGOs, for example. Uh, she, I remember at one point she, would, she talked about not just having to deal with the Congress or the bureaucracy in the State Department, but how little attention was paid uh, to some of those who influenced uh, not only policy, but the delivery of, of policy and I, uh, delivery of aid. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that, uh, sure, she was concerned about uh, governance and, 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 uh, and, and I'm sure disappointed in some of the developments that she saw in terms of stability. But she didn't, she was under no illusion uh, about what had to be done in order to uh, create conditions for the development of governance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where her emphasis was. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you want to add anything? Well, uh, she um, really focused on institutions, as Don said, at, at, a, at a time much earlier than many people do. And people in development now talk a lot about institutions. Institutions rule. Institutions are the only thing that matters, which is a little bit of an overstatement. <laughs> but years, more, more than a little bit, but years ago, she was talking about institutions and the underlying importance for development in Africa and, and saw... Uh, the, the growing distinctions within African countries of those that were beginning to work towards uh, strengthening democratic institutions and other institutions and those that were not as a fundamental driver of some of the differences in development. And she had that insight, I think, way before most people did. So. Now, uh, none of you has mentioned uh, the Qatar campus, and she made many a trip there because of the School of Foreign Service. Uh, she was... Um, always mentioning it to me about her latest trip and her uh, extraordinary uh, positive impression of some of the students and the potential that that, that represented for that part of the world. Um, and Islam, of course, is, is dealing with a crisis within Islam. Catherine, I don't know, you may have been closest to her on these issues, but can you... Uh, give us any understandings of what she was thinking, maybe as we look to the future, thinking more about what could be done uh, on that campus, potentially what it could lead to. I think the the crisis of within Islam, as you say, and the outbreak of violence and trying to understand it was very much one of the bees in her bonnet in the last couple of years that worried her. And she went round and round what it was that we needed to understand. Uh, the, the notion that we really need to work towards a basic understanding of religious literacy, for example, as a part of thinking about education for development and education for diplomacy, I think grew in part out of both the political uh, antennae that she had on the evangelical side, but also the sense that these issues of tensions, uh, we had a session this weekend on the clash of civilizations 
In other words, revisiting uh, what the significance is of, of, um, of those issues. So uh, she, you're right that she uh, was fascinated by the uh, Doha campus uh, and enjoyed uh, her trips there and talked a lot about the students and saw that very much as one of the doors uh, into um, having a better understanding uh, of those issues in that part of the world. We talked some about not just um, looking back, but looking forward, forward in policy as well as forward here at the university. What were those key areas? I mean, she obviously now has the GHD program. It's blossoming, and there's so many other you know, ways that she hijacked us from other projects to get us here to do the kinds of things she thought would make a difference. What was the unfinished business she saw on campus? <laughs> I'm laughing. Um, I uh, had the great pleasure of spending a weekend at the farm uh, over Labor Day weekend, I think, in early September. Steve Cashin was there, Son Shah was there, in September of 2013. And uh, uh, here is part of the email she sent a couple of days later. Unfinished tasks for me and <laughs> others. Uh, and this is only the first couple of pages. So. Um, uh, she saw many unfinished tasks around global human development and about uh, certificates uh, for uh, in many different areas in vulnerable and weak states and in global health, um, uh, a business skills option for undergraduate to BSFS students, uh, strengthening uh, the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, uh, uh, getting the Institute for Study of Diplomacy going, hire a new director, which has been done. Um, uh, uh, identify goals for SFS 2019 for fundraising, practical ethics initiative, better SFS communications, down and down, and, and it keeps on going. And I would love it if Carol was here today, except that she would be saying, where, where are we on all of these things, and why haven't we made <laughs> progress on them? So there are many, many uh, things here, I think, in the university. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to do, as she was so great at integrating thinking about economics, politics, institutions, we need to do an even better job of integrating our work in development. Uh, that's moving forward in many ways, uh, uh, and we've got some terrific people working on different aspects of development, and we're beginning to work together in many ways. The, the Global Futures Initiative that Tom is running on development this semester is a step forward on that. But I think um, I'm certain that she would want us to find new ways of getting the economists and the political science and the health people and others uh, to work on these issues going forward. And I think uh, there are many things I could talk about, but I think that's the one that I would focus on that, that she would want us to do, is to strengthen the pieces that we've got, but to make the sum greater than the, than, than the individual parts. Uh, and you will be sharing that memo with the new dean? It, exactly. As soon as, as soon as Jim tells me who it is, we'll... <laughs> tomorrow morning. He'll Carol, so. Carol was, uh, was very patient in terms of unfinished tasks. Uh, uh, was she patient was a, with you? Well, there she was wasn't a, patient <laughs> with the rest of us. But, but there was just a reference to the farm, and she and I shared uh, a hobby of old houses out in the same neck of the woods, and you had to be patient uh, in dealing with these old places. And we used to exchange uh, views about the latest disaster. <laughs> you know, she was so eclectic in her interests and passionate about all of them. <clears throat> Let me end this session before we move to our audience with um, a question to each of you, the same question, and it's very tough. If you had to pick one major impactful contribution of Carol Lancaster's, whether in terms of her impact on policy or her impact here, and if you want to cheat, you could do one of each, uh, but what would it be? Well, since you said I can cheat and do two, because there are immediately two that came to mind. One is her intellectual work, uh, best captured by this book on foreign aid diplomacy development and domestic politics, which does this comparative work on the institutions and politics, and the politics both in receiving countries and the domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And there is no better book that lays out in a scholarly way the different drivers in different countries uh, and, by, and, and, and what those mean. And, and for me, 
as I thought more about the drivers here of what's going on in Japan and Denmark, it made me learn, frankly, about myself and my own drivers, but also the United States drivers. So I think this is a terrific scholarly contribution. In terms of her contributions at, at, at Georgetown, you said that would be hard. It's easy. It's the GHD program. It's easy. <laughs> I think uh, I, I need to, too. All right. Um, I think clearly her role as a pioneer in not only modeling, but also thinking and pushing thought about gender issues was clearly one, one of the issues. I think she moved uh, a topic that sometimes can be fuzzy and, and uh, difficult uh, towards much more concrete actions with institutes, vital voices, uh, but also the personal, mm -hmm. personal example of overcoming so many challenges. Uh, and the other, I think, that really is one that still is a bee in my bonnet is this question of how do you make this focus on ethics into something that's lasting, real, and tangible? Because it's an ethics, thinking about ethics and development and diplomacy is not a question of virtue. It's not a question of um, trying to make people behave better. It's recognizing the complexity and the conflicting forces that are at work and helping people to come to terms with how you deal with them and seeing alternate positions, which is something that a couple of people have mentioned, uh, opening horizons more widely in this age of globalization, getting out of narrow perspectives. And I, I think her view that Georgetown should be a leader in this was an important view and one that we should follow up. And not to preempt what you're going to say, uh, Don, but if I could add to it, one of the things that she was grappling with was the future of the Institute for Diplomacy. And her big question is, what is diplomacy today? What should we be focused on? Where does diplomacy have to go? Uh, and maybe you could factor that into whatever you were going to say. Well, I, <coughs> I served with her when she headed up the uh, uh, search committee for not the current uh, director, but the preceding one. And uh, I also uh, spoke with her at length as she tried to think about uh, the next one. And, and I, I know that she was grappling with uh, how we as an educational institution tied our studies uh, with diplomacy. What, what, did it, what did it mean and what changes ought to be made in the institute and the institute's relationship with the, all the other sections of, of the School of Foreign Service and the university? So that it was something that, uh, that uh, whose contribution was clear and and was distinct, and she had wrestled with that uh, in, in the earlier search, and she was still doing the same thing uh, later on. She was just constantly questioning uh, what ought to be done mm -hmm. with the, with the institute. I think uh, I I. I and sold on the idea of uh, the global human development as her contribution because I think in the final analysis uh, that is the, uh, the, the a it encompasses it, it it encompasses so much of the development program whether it's uh, whether it is training people in theory uh, getting them out to deal with practicalities, practical experience, and, and reflecting on the, the intersection of those two. And I, I think that program is going to, going to be one of her real contributions. But I think there's another one which she was just starting to toy with. And it had to do with how we integrated the various programs here on the campus. Mm. Whether we were, whether the tail was wagging the dog in some programs as we created them, um, and sometimes thinking more of the money which would come in mm. to create it rather than 
how we're going to coordinate it and, and integrate mm -hmm. those. Um, I, I think I had several conversations with her, with her about that in the, in the last year or so of her life. And I, I think uh, what she started to think about and what she, as Carol being Carol, uh, started to pass around to others um, is going to be on our plate uh, more and more. More of the unfinished agenda. So other questions from all of you, reflections, um, comments on any of this? Jennifer Windsor, and uh, I had the pleasure um, and the fortitude to work with Carol twice <laughs> in my life. Um, first, when I was special assistant to Brian Atwood when she was the deputy administrator, and uh, Brian had a habit of um, of assigning, just talking to whoever was in the room and telling them to do something, and so <laughs> Carol and I would run into each other um, both doing the same task that we had received from Brian. And Carol um, asserted very demurely, as you can say, that I was the special assistant and she was the deputy administrator. So we decided that we would have this end run communication system where Brian would both give us our assignments and we'd run back to each other's offices, call each other, divide up what should have been the allocation of tasks, and then come back. So. Um, <laughs> And then I got to be her friend for, for two decades. Um, and I know that Catherine said something about her friendship. And she, she was an amazing friend. Um, and really, uh, you know, welcomed me in, literally into her family and in her house when I was, was hurt and um, needed some help. Um, and and, and really throughout the years. Um, so I miss her friendship a lot. The second time I worked for her was when she convinced me that I should lead, leave the NGO that I was headed and relax at a Georgetown <laughs> position uh, as her associate well, dean <laughs> for programs, which really meant whatever Carol came up with that morning. And as you read that list, um, at you know, at some point or the other, I was either in charge of HR, toilet paper, the Global Human <laughs> Development Program, hand soap, um, you know, uh, Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, getting better events, making sure everybody ate the food at the events. Um, she was tireless. And we had a, one big difference, and that was actually how much we slept and when we slept. And I, for anybody that knows me, am not an early morning person. Mm -hmm. Carol would start, sometimes at 4.30, sometimes at 5, and there she'd just churn out email after email. So you'd wake up and you'd look at your, you know, your phone or your computer, and there'd be 20 emails with different <laughs> tasks that you were supposed to accomplish that day. So um, it wasn't really, she kind of sold me on, um, on a job that, but it was, a, it was a tremendous amount of fun. And, but she was constantly, constantly pushing for more, more, more. And she pushed me and sometimes I didn't really appreciate it. But looking back on it, I think she understood this Georgetown and she understood that this as an institution will respond to somebody that's constantly pushing and figuring out ways around it. She knew the politics of Georgetown just like she knew the politics of how to use the White House during the aid times. So um, I think she would say to all of, all of you that remain at Georgetown, um, keep figuring out ways to make this a better place. Um, and I think one of the things that struck me the most about her illness, and it's right after she had her surgery, and I went to visit her at, um, at the hospital, and she was very, very upset about the Central African Republic <laughs> and the atrocities going on. She had just been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And what she was really concerned about is, you know, do you have your notepad, Jennifer? You work with Catherine Marshall. We have got to do something on the Central African Republic. We have to understand the nature of evil and how it manifests itself. So that's my lasting thought of Carol, which is 
when faced with her own challenge, she immediately wanted to figure out how to deal with the larger world issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Others? Barbara? Hi, I'm Barbara Turner. I worked with Carol at USAID. Uh, when she was the deputy administrator, I was um, working on the Eastern Europe program, you can imagine, in 1993, um, working on the former Soviet Union countries and trying to figure out what was a sensible development, not political, but development program there. Um, it was quite, I, to be honest with you, um, the political process in Washington, um, deputy assistant administrator, deputy administrators rather, are appointed by the president, confirmed by Congress, and often come in with lofty ideas of what they're going to accomplish and see the practitioners as the enemy uh, in the bureaucracy. And um, Carol indeed was not that. She immediately embraced us. Um, she reached down to me, who uh, I was just on a task force as the deputy leader of the task force. And that time, the administration, that not uh, the prior to the Clinton administration, uh, the former Soviet was seen as a short-term problem. Um, there was no bureau created for it or program. It was simply a task force. Carol saw that that made no sense. Um, a bureau was created. She pulled quite a few of practitioners, including me, up into a position of the deputy assistant administrator of that bureau. So that um, she wanted to make sure that we had a, a sense of, of policy and practical together. Um, but we were a little afraid of her because uh, she was known for Africa. Um, and um, the former Soviet countries not exactly like Africa. Actually, in many ways at that time, it was worse in terms of its institutional capacity and a number of other things. But it wasn't uh, exactly um, Africa. And so we were very nervous that she would come in and not really understand how to work in that region or um, take us off on a, some other tangent than, than what we had determined to be. Um, but indeed, she spent a lot of time with us. Um, grilling us, asking us really solid, good questions. Um, she studied hard. She learned a lot about uh, the countries, the politics. She worked with the White House and the State Department to understand it. And even one day she announced to me she was going to learn Russian. And I thought, oh, yeah, right. I've been studying it for a couple of years. I can barely say good morning. And um, she's got a full-time job uh, with all of this, and she's going to learn Russian. But actually, she learned Russian. Um, uh, so it, she was somebody who at first uh, kind of feared and kind of shook in your boots a little bit when you had to go in and face her. But her questions and her issues were always good. She obviously saw that, that development, in fact, not only were we a task force, our projects could only be one year because surely everything would be solved in one year. In, in Russia and Ukraine and Central Asia, the Caucasus. Um, and she right away said, don't pay any attention to that. We're just not going to do it. <laughs> We're going to change that. She gave us the cover to do that. She right away created a bureau, um, not all by herself, but, but obviously convinced the, the bureaucracy um, to do that. She pushed us hard on privatization issues to make sure that we weren't privatizing for the oligarchy, but in fact, how are we doing uh, the small little shops? How are we focused on that? What were we measuring? How were we doing that constantly? She made us think about what we were doing. She pushed us really hard on women's in engagement. And while gender had been for a long time something you check off the box, we had not really um, addressed it in, in the kind of policy sense that needed to be in a male-dominated society in the former Soviet um, countries. And so she was constantly looking for opportunities um, to identify with women technocrats, to, to use um, some of the university cover to, to connect and give more empowerment to, to women in the process. And she really forced all of our uh, practitioners to think about that all of the time. Um, I just want to reinforce that I, better than almost anyone I've worked with, she did indeed embrace, pull up, and promote um, the practitioners. She sent some of us on trips with the White House. Um, very seldom that, that a uh, career employee ever traveled with the president or first lady, but Carol put some of us uh, on those trips, uh, had confidence that we would have something to offer rather than just the president's political appointee. Not just, but rather than the president's political appointee. Um, so I feel she really did make that marriage um, work and brought us together to work um, hand in hand. I hope that the Global Development Program never loses that because I think um, I am a development practitioner. I'll confess I come from that, that angle. Um, I don't think we have enough academic rigor in the, pra in the practitioner community, and I don't think we have enough practitioner in the academic community. And if they, it's the only thing that's going to make development work is bringing that, that measurement and thinking together with the reality of making it happen on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I think that point about Carol putting her staff forward 
Now, the coveting of a White House trip, I can't tell you the shenanigans that would go on <laughs> to get on the airplane. And the, the thought that she would have her staff person go, and I know Barbara traveled on many of these, rather than saying, no, I'm going. And it's the same kind of investment in the students. You see that same magnanimous um, investment in a way because she knew what it would lead to in terms of the future. Others? Yes, Jim. So, uh, so this, uh, this seminar has focused on Carol's contributions to development and women's affairs and the like, and I think quite appropriately so because that was her chief professional focus. Um, but I think of Carol as slightly different. I think of Carol as kind of vol volcano of humanity. <laughs> and uh, I could well imagine Carol as the Barbara Mikulski of Anacostia, <laughs> or as the Coco Chanel of jewelry. Uh, I think wherever her, whatever life sort of directed her, whatever chance uh, along the way kind of deflected her, I think she would have had the same kind of impact. And therefore, I guess I would say her chief legacy is her effect on each of us. That um, I think of Carol as somebody that is a kind of goad or reminder of how little I'm doing and how much more I could do and how much I could do it better with a greater sense of generosity, uh, of commitment, and of energy. And, and I would say, that's the reason everybody's in this room. Uh, coincidentally, yes, she was in development, but fundamentally, she was that great human, human being that touched us all, so. Well. You know, Jim, I don't think anybody can top that, so. Uh, we will continue this conversation over the reception, and I know everybody's got their own stories, but I think in the end, Jim hit the nail, which is it was the person that she was, and she was an extraordinary human being. So thank you. How coming from France, so hearing about this conversation, uh, we decided uh, with my friend Anne to come from France uh, just uh, to be with you. And so we had the pleasure and the honor to work with Carol on a book about multiculturalism and diplomacy. And so I was working at the Prime Minister's services and I met a lot of uh, uh, great minds and uh, so. And I just want to read you a paper we brought for the family because she was working with us about this subject. So, and you will see how wonderful it is the way Carol is entering in a questioning point. So, you will forget my accent. <laughs> so, here we are. I am trying to think very broadly out of my usual boxes of how what I write can be helpful to you as you reach beyond analytical horizons. For I am not sure what, but suspect some revealed mystery of how people from very different places, cultures, life experience, classes, languages, communicate or do they? And can we really know? This, I remember, is your life passion as a Basque. And you know how important for Basque it's important to come here because so. In a world of no Basque, a minority? <laughs> so she was asking. In a world of majorities and other minorities. And then, so below are some so thoughts based on my own life experiences of talking and living multi. I wonder if they will be useful. See how. First, a word about me, and then I will ask the family if we, because, so, so it's Thank Carol. you so much. So. <laughs> So 
So are you publishing that or? Yes. 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 Okay. We, Yet another book. We will take the text, the family first, because one is from her and the second is an essay. <laughs> and the publisher will be Acta Sud in France. Yes. Excellent. Yes, we have a, we are directing collection. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming and to all of you as well and now uh, to share some more reflections and good conversation and uh, thoughts about this amazing giant who was among our 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 in our midst uh, and who is still prodding us wherever she is. Thank you all.